Once again, if you're newer to the church, I want to encourage you that today is a day to go to our membership class, Discover VBC after the service. Even if you couldn't go last week, I want to encourage you, if you're newer to the church, want to learn more about our church, just go check out that class. Be impulsive down the hallway to the left. And I'm excited for the class today because I get to hold a Q&A, question and answer time, where you can ask me questions about our church. Uh, you can ask me questions about our theology. You can ask me personal questions. I don't have to answer those, but you can ask whatever you want. So I am looking forward to meeting you and greeting you and answering questions down the hall to the left right after the service. This morning, we are finishing up the Sermon on the Mount. Next week, we are going to go to the book of Nehemiah. But this morning, we are finishing up the Sermon on the Mount. And what a way to end a sermon. I don't know if you caught what Jesus said, but let me refresh you with a few of his phrases. He said, most go down the road of destruction. If you don't bear fruit, then you will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I never knew you. Depart from me. And the house fell with a great crash. And you may wonder, is Jesus trying to scare you into the kingdom? Is he trying to make you afraid of God's wrath and to frighten you into the kingdom? Well, let me explain it this way. Let's say I went over to your house and you had a natural gas leak. And you also had a problem with smelling them. You could not smell very well. And I come in, I say, your house smells like natural gas. We need to get out of here. And you're like, I don't smell anything. And I have this app on my phone that somehow detects natural gas. I say, look, massive amount of natural gas is in your house right now. And you go, okay, would you think that I'm trying to scare you or save you? Save you. Jesus is not trying to scare them for scare's sake. He wants them to hear his teaching and to respond to his teaching. And what this calls for this morning, just like his original hearers, it calls for an assessment of your life. Are you playing games with God, even with an open Bible, where you hear the word of God and you don't respond to it? Every now and then, I think it's very important to examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. And here at the end, Jesus is pressing that, pressing that, like you heard me, but did you really hear me? Because those who hear me obey me. And he gives these little images here. Uh, I call them sketches. Uh, where there is a right way to live and a wrong way to live. In fact, there's only two ways to live. And he gives these little sketches of two roads, two trees, two disciples, and two houses. That's where he's going to go. Two roads, two trees, two disciples, and two houses. And basically two ways to live. And what I want to have happen here this morning is the same way that teaching hit the earlier disciples and the crowd. Some, somehow Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we speak into you this morning through the end of this sermon. So let's start with two roads. And I am, I am just going to straight up give you Jesus' words this morning as best as I can. I'm not going to try to cushion them or make them easier to bring. I mean, these are hard hitting words from Jesus. Let's look at two roads. Chapter 7 of Matthew, start with verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. The broad road here is, is filled with people living the opposite of what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount. It's the path that most take because many that enter through it are many. And there is a sense of community in such large numbers. If so many people are doing it, how can it possibly be wrong? So that's where most go on the broad road and the broad road is crowded. And if you notice, the broad road is easy. 
It's easy to join the crowd and it's easy to take the broad road because for real, think about Jesus' teaching. It's, it's easy to do the opposite of that. It's easy to hate people. It's easy to judge people. It's easy to live in sexual morality. It's easy to not forgive. These are easy things. It's easy to pursue money. It's easy to be greedy. This is just all the things that come natural. And most of the world is on the broad path to destruction. It's crowded and it's easy. And yet it ends, did you notice, in destruction. That would be hell. That would be wrath. That would be a conscious torment forever. But what about the narrow way? Well, verse 14. For the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are a few who find it. So the way of following Jesus is narrow. Now, that doesn't mean that the gospel is, is not proclaimed to all the world. No one is excluded from receiving the offer of repentance and faith in Jesus. The issue is most people do not choose the easy road because the narrow way of following Jesus is hard. Let's just be honest. It's hard to follow Jesus. It's a constricted path. It's a path of poverty of spirit, mourning over sin, enduring persecution, fighting the flesh and striving for purity, humbling ourselves in reconciliation, staying in difficult relationships, loving our enemies, and seeking first the kingdom of God and not ours. And yes, there are scriptures that talk about joy in the Lord. There are scriptures that, that talk about following him as these great peace. But let's not downplay the fact that Jesus is saying that following him on the narrow road is hard. And that's probably why only a few find it and take this road. Well, last night I was trying to explain to one of my kids this, this idea here. And I was being really dramatic. I was standing up. And I was like, yeah, there's this broad road. And Everybody who wants to live this comfortable life, it's easy, the broad road, but following Jesus is this narrow, narrow road. And he said, well, well my road's kind of like this. It's curvy. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's right. Because following Jesus on the, on the narrow road it, it is curvy, right? It, it's challenging. It, it's difficult. And, and it's hard. And, and Jesus says, a, a few find it because it's, it's a constricted road. My last church was next to Northwestern University, so there was a lot of college students in there. And from time to time, the college students that would graduate would come back years later for a kind of reunion. And so I'd love to see them there on Sunday morning. One Sunday morning, a reunion of college students took place. They, they said, hey, Pastor Jason, we want to get on the stage. We want to take a picture of our class. And so they got on the stage, and they took their picture. And, and one of the girls pulled me aside. She says, isn't it so exciting to see this many people still following Jesus. And I was so pumped and I was so encouraged. But then as I was going home, I started thinking about the people that weren't there, those who have bailed on Jesus, those who've turned their back on Christ, those who said, no, the narrow road is too hard. There is a, a word I'm going to tell you that you may not have heard about, and it's okay, but you know the word evangelical, right? Well, there is a word floating around mainly on social media now. It's called exvangelical. Exvangelical. And it's mainly from the children who were raised in evangelical churches who have rebelled against the gospel. Now, of course, they're, they're rebelling also against many of the American trappings they were raised in, but a lot of them are abandoning the faith altogether because it's easy to blend in with the culture. And so it's, it's uh, in fact, one of the most famous pastors that I respect, John Piper. One of his sons is a huge speaker. This won't make any sense to you. He's, he's doing these big TikTok videos, which basically means videos where he is mocking and making fun of those who believe in Jesus because the road to destruction is broad and that's where most are going. But those who follow Jesus, it is a narrow road and it will be hard. This is Jesus' teaching. He, he does not let up. He continues. Now he goes to two trees, two trees, verse 15. 
Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Hmm. So we're trying to make a judgment here about false prophets. So these false prophets, they look like believers. They come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves, all right? So false prophets are in the house. That means they're in the, they're in the church. Well, Jesus tells us how to recognize these false prophets. Verse 16, you will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. It's the heart of a person that produces fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear fruit bad fruit, but good fruit in keeping with the character of its health. That would be obedience. And a diseased tree cannot bear good fruit, but bad fruit in keeping with its character of corruption. That would be disobedience. Now I'm going to pull back for a moment, and I'll do this from time to time to explain something. I'm going to take a sermon time out. You all right with this? Sermon time out. All right, pay attention. It's time out time. I want to say a word concerning fruit. I care a lot about fruit. I eat about one to two apples a day. Some of them are good. Some of them are bad. Um, And I should care more about spiritual fruit. Get this. I want to make sure you understand this. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and the finished work of Christ alone. Okay? We're good? Now, all those who are saved by faith alone need to understand that your faith is not alone in that it will produce fruit, obedience. Because a true believer, the Holy Spirit of God dwells in them, empowers them, not perfectly, but empowers them to obey the commands of God. So we are saved by grace, not by works, and yet those who are saved by grace will produce works. And we try to teach our kids this when they're, when they're little. Uh, my kids used to go through an Awana program, and Awana has one of its main verses that they would say each week comes from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 10. And this is the verse that they would say all the time, and it, it sums up this idea. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. All right, you got it? Grace alone. Say by grace alone, faith alone. And yet the person who is saved by grace alone through faith alone will produce good works because that's what they've been created in Christ Jesus to do. And get this, if there is no good works, There's no fruit, and no fruit, no evidence of salvation, then comes destruction, thrown into the fire, and burned. D.A. Carson, great scholar, put it like this. He said this. He says, it is true, of course, that no man enters the kingdom because of his obedience, but it is equally true that no man enters the kingdom who is not obedient. And just to put it bluntly, if there's no life change in obedience, there's no salvation. And then no salvation, then ultimate destruction and judgment. Okay, let's do it like time in, all right? We're done with that, all right? Time in. What's he talking about here? Oh, he's talking about false prophets. And he says, back to the warning of false prophets, you'll be able to tell a false prophet or a pastor or an elder or a Bible study leader by their teaching, character, and behavior. You'll be able to tell a false prophet, whether he's a pastor or an elder or a Bible study leader, by their teaching, character, and behavior. Which means that someone may have sound doctrine, good teaching, and yet... They have a secret sinful lifestyle, 
away from the Lord. Or a, a false prophet may look good on the outside, may look moral, and yet they are preaching heresy, false teacher. And the Bible is very clear that teachers, preachers, small group leaders, Bible study leaders, we need to watch our doctrine and our lives closely, right? But you also need to watch our doctrine and our lives closely because you must be aware of false prophets because they'll look good. And many of them look good on your TV. Many of them look good on your computer. You say, Pastor Jason, I love this person. What do you think about them? And I have no problem when it's appropriate to say, stop listening to them, throw that book away, turn it off. I know some of you get mad when I say that, but there are false teachers and false prophets that are all over the Christian world that we must be aware of. And we'll know them by their teaching, their doctrine, and the fruit of their lives. Jesus is still going, right? This one's the hardest one for me, the two disciples. Look at verse 21. Verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. And here we have two kinds of disciples, okay? And this one really is disturbing to me because only one set of disciples gets into heaven. He's very clear that it's only the disciples who obey his Father's will get into heaven. They're, they're going to be many so-called disciples out there who say, Lord, 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 but they don't get in. They think they're in, but they're not in. This is very disturbing because you can be here this morning and you can say, Jesus is the Lord of my life. It doesn't mean you're saved because people right here are saying, Lord, Lord. Well, Jesus continues to explain in verses 22 and 23. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And your name cast out demons and your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to you, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Wow. Here are some disciples that are doing some very impressive outward signs and serving the Lord. They are exhibiting these great charismatic gifts. They're prophesying in Jesus' name. And I have no reason to believe that this is false prophecy. It says they are casting out demons in Jesus' name. And there's no reason to think that these are not legit exorcisms. And they work a variety of miracles, probably like healing in Jesus' name. And there's no reason to think that these aren't legit healings. They're doing all these great works in Jesus' name. And yet, when they die, they will hear, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Preaching great sermons. Doing great works in Jesus' name does not mean that you're saved. It's not about preaching. It's not about exorcisms. It's not about healings. It's not about prophesying. The issue is, do you know Christ that produces a transformed life or are you like these people where he says very clearly, workers of lawlessness? I never knew you. I never knew you. They did not have a relationship with Jesus. If, if they had a relationship with Jesus, then they would have a transformed life. Not perfect, but it produces, as we saw in the earlier of the Sermon on the Mount, something called this exceeding righteousness where they bear fruit, where they obey, not perfectly, but by the grace of God. But instead, these workers of lawlessness, Jesus doesn't know. This is very similar to what Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, 2. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, 
I am nothing. I can do great works. You can do great works. But if that is not leading to love and obedience, Jesus says, depart from me. And I just wondered, how is this possible? How is this this possible? Because let's just shoot straight. Christians, including myself, we do a lot of foolish things, right? We make bad decisions. We sin. We do foolish things. But what do we do when we do those things? We feel convicted. We say, Lord, please forgive me. Give me your grace. I need you. I'm broken. Right, right? The issue is not are we sinners or not because we are sinners. Here's the issue. Are you a repentant sinner? Are you a repentant sinner? Because we're all sinners. The person who is in their sin, it's habitual, continuing, ongoing, no repentance, I fear for you. Because a lot of times down south, we have this idea that if you walk the altar, we say, boom, once saved, always saved. And once saved, always saved is the correct theology, but maybe you were never saved. Right? Because if you are saved, it will produce fruit and God's grace in your life will produce good works, not perfectly, because we're all sinners. The issue is, are you a repentant sinner? Now, you know that it wasn't just the disciples hearing him. Did you know there was a crowd hearing him as well? Before we look at the last one, I want you to jump down to verses 28 and 29. Verses 28 and 29. So when Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. For his, he was teaching them as one having authority, not as their scribes. Huh. It says the crowds were astonished. The crowds were amazed. Does that save you? Does it save you that you're amazed or astonished at Jesus' teaching? No, it doesn't save you. Because Jesus is correct. If you follow the rest of the Gospels, most of the crowd stayed on the broad road to destruction. The Gospel goes out to everybody, but most do not respond on the narrow way because it is hard. And it's by, right, it is hard. It's a narrow way. Jesus says, road's broad. Most are going there. Those who follow the narrow way of Christ alone, it's hard. His teaching, not mine. It's his teaching. This is not overturned anywhere. And then he finishes it by talking about two houses. And this is the one you're probably the most familiar with. Two houses or two foundations. Verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. The focus here is on the builders and what they built. The builder who built his house on the solid foundation of rock is pointing to the one who heard Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount, And they actually obeyed them. They had a transformed life. They realized they were spiritually bankrupt without Christ. They were poor in spirit. They built this house on a rock. And when the wrath of God, the judgment of God came, they stood in the judgment, stood in Christ. But the builder who built his house on the sand is the foolish one who hears Jesus' words and does not do them or obey them. And the judgment of God came and, and they were disobedient. And their lives fell with a great crash as wrath came and they were not safe in Christ. This is hard teaching. This is hard teaching because those who are on the broad road, their life can look really good. They can be outwardly moral. I mean, I could talk about they out there, but I could be talking in here as well. You could be outwardly moral. Things are going great. 
You don't want to reconsider anything else because you got your life kind of together. And you're like, what's the problem? I don't need God. And I want to say to you, you may look good now, but there is a judgment coming. And your whole life will be upended forever. It reminds me when I had a new kitchen floor put in in my house in Chicago. The, the builders came to install the new floor, but first they had to rip up the old floor. And as they were ripping up the old floor, they discovered that they were actually ripping up four floors because it was floor built upon floor, built upon floor, built upon floor. And I thought that was interesting because I got to see some of the floors. So the people who put the floors in, in the 50s thought they were putting in a very special floor, and they probably thought it was keen. Was that the word you used in the 50s? <laughs> but then that one was ripped out, and it was replaced by a floor that looked like it was from the 60s and 70s. It was kind of looked like a sparkly disco ball. And the builders probably thought it was groovy. (laughs) Then again, it was replaced in the 80s. And the 80s floor was like a bright yellow pattern floor that they probably thought was awesome. And then came the 90s. And the 90s floor was just plain and just fine. But what was very interesting that no matter how perfect the floor the builders put in, and I guarantee you every person thought this is the best floor ever. It was all ripped up. And guess what? We put in our brand new floor that's going to last forever. <laughs> uh uh-uh. I don't care how awesome it was. It was hardwood floors. That's the best, right? It's going to last forever. Nope. One day, it's going to be ripped up. So no matter how great your life may look now, may feel now, 401K got you set. Got a, got a good golf game right now. Got some good health. Judgment's coming. And apart from Christ, you'll face the full wrath of God in destruction, in hell. That will last forever. I'm not making this up. I didn't create this theology. It's from Jesus. And you may say, well, why does God send anybody? Why does he send anybody to hell? And I just got to ask, well, why should he send anybody to heaven? He's holy. We're sinful. And so if you find yourself at a point this morning and you want to enter the narrow way and you want to be a healthy tree that bears fruit and you want to be a disciple who knows Jesus as Lord and you want to be building on the solid foundation of obedience, well, what do you do? Do you start jumping through hoops and say, okay, God, watch me. I'm going to obey. Is this good enough? Am I doing good enough works to get into heaven? No. Where did Jesus start with the sermon? He said, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit realize they are spiritually bankrupt and bring nothing to God but their own sin. But it's not enough just to say, okay, I'm a sinner. What did Jesus say next? He said, blessed are those who mourn. Those who are mourning, not only of the sinful effects in the world, but the sin in their own life. That is repentance. Repentance when you realize that you not only have you sinned against a holy God, but you deserve punishment forever. And those who enter the kingdom are broken people, repentant people who are mourning over their sin and then enter Jesus. The book of Matthew says that Jesus came to save his people from their sins. That's why Jesus came. Lived a perfect life that you couldn't live, I couldn't live. Died a death on the cross that I couldn't die, bearing the wrath of God, buried and rose again. And the offer is all who put their faith in Jesus will be forgiven. In brokenness and repentance, put your faith in Jesus and have your life forgiven, clothed in righteousness, and changed. And you will produce fruit. You will still sin, you'll still do a lot of foolish things but you will be a repentant sinner. And only repentant sinners are forgiven by the grace of God. Now I want to do something that I don't do. 
I have not done it here. I don't know if I've done it in a long time. It's, it's very Baptistic. I'm not going to do an altar call, so it's okay. <clears throat> but I do want to do this. I want to ask everyone to close their eyes in prayer. And then where you're sitting here this morning, if you've been examining your life and what you see is not what a Christian should look like. In fact, maybe you've been putting on a good front for others. I mean, think about it, the things that you're passionate about, the way you care for others and the way you spend your discretionary time and money, you know, would your spouse or your children or your closest friends characterize you as a serious follower of Jesus? Well, forget about what they think. Do you believe Jesus himself considers you one of his true followers? Do you believe Jesus himself considers you one of his true followers? And if the answer is no, and you want to put your faith in Christ today, no matter if you've gone to church your whole life, that in your heart you want to repent. You want to trust Christ for forgiveness. I mean, everybody is praying. They have their their eyes closed. I'm just wondering, in this commitment time right now, would you stand up? Would you just go ahead and stand up? So for those of you who are trusting Christ and you don't want the Lord, Lord, depart from me. I pray for you right now that it's not about your works. It's not about jumping through hoops. It's about grace and a transformed life. And I pray for you, my brothers and sisters. That's what you are, my brothers and sisters. I just ask, Lord, that you would be with them right now and so fill them with your spirit and overwhelm them with your grace that the old is gone, the new has come. And I ask, Lord, that you would do this transforming, ongoing work of your love and grace in their lives so they are going to produce fruit. They are going to obey by your power and they are going to trust you and live this way out of a gospel transform life do this work now Lord do this work now in all of us transforming us and the commitment that my brothers and sisters are making today may you hear may you see may you forgive And may you continue to do the work that you've started until we see you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen.